Welcome to True House Stories. I am back in New York City after a long UK tour that was absolutely blinding and incredible in every way. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, it was my first time back in the UK after the COVID has been in motion, even though it's in our rearview mirror. I must say, thank God we're all good and we're running. And it was great to see so many faces and so many wonderful gigs. But what I'm going to bring up right now is a true legend of this game. And it's not often I get many promoters that have the great stories to go with the legacy of a night called Back to Basics. This guy started in the 80s, made his name, and he's going to tell you all about it. He is in Wikipedia. He's a legendary guy. Okay, not many, like I said, not many promoters get that shining light of beacon, but this man does. And I'm going to bring him up. All the way from Leeds, I had the time of being at his club again this past weekend, which was absolutely amazing. Back to Basics founder, the man himself, Dave Beers from the UK. Hello there, guys. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Dave, thank you, mate, for coming on. And thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been absolutely amazing to see and, and get everybody to, to be able to appreciate and hear the stories of guys like yourself that never get a chance to be heard. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm not too sure about that. <laughs> but you're not one of those who can be heard nice and loud all the time. <laughs> yeah. I'm too much sometimes, I'm told. So, as Dave Beer is a man for the 11th hour, 23rd minute, 59th second to almost us going, he hits me up and says, hey, I got a crap load of stuff I need to give you. I'm like, okay. So we're going to try to get all this in, but here's the thing. Well, in my defense, I, I, I wasn't told until the last minute. <laughs> it's okay. On the defense of Karen and myself, we may have left that out. And but, been, um, but, we actually have some, yeah, but we have some good stuff. I got some clips okay. of him. So let's go and let's begin this journey. Um, everybody who has come on this show who has graced us before starts out the same way. And I know... You have a fantastic story. So let's not waste no more time and let's get right into how does music find the young kid, Dave Beer? Teenage, and then. Well, I think I probably came through um, my mum. Um, I was from a single, single family, single parent family in, um, in Pontefract, um, a little coal mining town in, uh, in West Yorkshire in the north of England. And um, yeah, it was a. Uh, it's quite a tough upbringing, um, but um, I used to listen to my mum's like rock and roll records, and um, she she would be dancing downstairs and jiving, and be listening. So um, and then um, after that, it was kind of like punk rock happened in England, and I I wasn't so good at school, you know. I had um, as it's turned out, I have ADHD. But in those days, it wasn't diagnosed. So, um, so I, I actually ran away from home when I was about fifteen, and I ran away with a band called The Clash. I, don't, I think you guys have heard of them. Um, and uh, so that was the beginning of my my musical um, adventures. And I uh, hit the road running, and I went on tour, roadieing with bands. And um, and uh, travelled a lot in America, um, uh, which is like after the punk rock thing, I went through the indie thing. And uh, I always loved drum machines, so uh, you know bands like Kraftwerk and um, uh, you know like the German industrial sound and the the kind of British electronic federation sounds that were going on at the time. And uh, which led into when we um, used to uh, unload the trucks in uh, after the gigs with the bands that I was with. I was with Run DMC, Public Enemy um, in America, um, 
you know, Weep Up a Girl rappers, people like that, but Petrol Emotion. So we travelled a lot of the usual North Coast tours that you do on the old buses there. And uh, but after we'd loaded up, we had we, there was nowhere to go. So the only places we could find were the, were these clubs that were open, and they were just like black gay clubs, which suited me fine. You know, we were we were in there. It was like a kid in a candy shop, and um, uh, yeah, we we fell across places like like the Paradise Garage, like the Loft, like like um, many clubs um, in Chicago in. Um, you know, like the, the warehouse, the metro, I remember, um, and Detroit. So the, in England at the same time, this was about 1987 at the end of it, um, after touring in America for about three years. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I'd got back to England and uh, the Hacienda had, uh, had started his an acid house night. And the explosion had gone off. I mean, really gone off. I mean, everyone in England, from policemen to nurses to doctors to to oboes to you know, everybody was raving. Everybody's popping these little pills and and dancing. And um, I remember the first time I was bringing over American DJs and uh, you know, people like um, Morales and Little Louis Vega. And, um, all, all of them, really, Franz Beckervorkian. Um, uh, I mean, like we, I used to just come over and, to America and hunt them down and so go to places like Save the Robots or the Sound Factory and, you know, and um, when Baskers was playing at the time, but he would never get on an aeroplane. But, uh, but <laughs> yeah, but, yeah he, but, he was like, no way, I'm not flying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's too busy tweaking out, yeah. So it's like, no, man. You know, but um, I, I, in England at that time, DJs were playing for about uh, one and a half hours. And this guy was playing for 18 hours, you know, it's like, and we were just like, whoa, you know, this is something else, you know what I mean? And we, we did the duration. One weekend we stayed in there from the Friday night over, and we just slept in there in the morning. We wouldn't leave and we stayed there till the Saturday and went through to Sunday. That was kind of fun. And we used to go to the limelight a lot as well. It's like uh, to the limelight a lot to um, hang out with the Disco 2000 kids, which um, that ended in a bit of tragedy. But um, but you know we were there right at the time. I remember Kiyoki telling me what had gone on with Michael and Angel, and it was like whoa. Wait a minute, were you around that time when that whole criminal thing happened with uh, yeah, Michael yeah. Allen killing? Yeah, no, no, I, think we, I remember we were you were in New York at that time because I was yeah. in the tunnel at that time. I remember, yeah, yeah, we were hanging out with those guys, you know, <laughs> like we were doing parties with them, and it was like, we, I mean, it was just crazy. I mean, we could, I mean, luckily for me, I'd flown out to back to England and had taken some of the um, some of the some of the tra- to, to TV, some of the transvestites, like you know, with the big platforms on onto the airplane. I, I was so out of it. I'd shaved all my hair off and because uh, I had really long hair. And uh, Kiyoki said, you should go to Patricia Fields. You know, so I was like, right, Patricia Fields, what's this? So I went down there and there was this uh, this really like outrageous guy, gal guy. And I said, I'm like, oh my God. And I said, I said, now, Kiyoki said, you could uh, tell me that, to get rid of this, this. And she goes, you've come to the right place because we hate hair. And then she just shaved all my hair off. <laughs> and uh, and I went down to Greenwich Village and got some platforms put on my sneakers, so like not big ones, but you know, little, small enough, you know, big enough to make myself a little bit taller. And then I just said to these guys, like, why don't you come back to England with me? So I paid for these two like uh, club kids to come back to uh, England for the weekend uh, with no luggage, no nothing, just like the the same makeup on that they set up in from New York. And I just got, we came off the plane in Leeds and we were just voguing, you know, it's like, and people were like, what is going on? You know, it was brilliant. You know, you can imagine on a wet Wednesday, a wet Sunday morning though, but you know, when everybody's coming down a bit, you know, what the, what the guys felt like, we were trying to get them onto an aeroplane to get them back to New York. You know, but it was fantastic, fantastic, really. Dave, here's a question for you. You come into New York. Were you what I would say a a a kid that 
I know you work with the Clash and you did all that stuff. Were you like what we would say a kid that had money at that no. time? No, so you. No, 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 no. Well, I mean, but by the time like the club had blown up, when we were coming to the to, because I, I was like roadieing with like say when I was with Run DMC and and it was all around and uh, do the right thing time, you know, like Spike Lee. So I just wanted to be down Bedford Stuyvesant, you know. I got myself in all sorts of trouble, man. You remember back in the, down there in sure. 1984, 85, and uh, I was the only white kid there with my Bart Simpson T-shirt and my skateboard, <laughs> and like you know, I'm going, I ain't got no be for you guys and they're going you are the big you are the fucking problem man you know I'm like oh, oh they would tell wait so they would tell me because first of all they probably heard the accent said what's up yeah. with the accent they're not this is not a New York kid so that's yeah. something that start like that and so like they couldn't understand me really I mean <laughs> when I'm in America nobody really understands me it's only recently that I realized that I mean you're bilingual so you know you're yeah right I'm bilingual I understand everybody in England I can yeah, yeah. what accent it's yeah. crazy but um, you know, and some people do, and some people don't. But like, what, uh, and what, I'm like, what, did, that, what did that guy say? But it's great when you walk into it, walk up to a club to the rope with a big hat on, and you just take the clipboard off the door, man, and you climb over the rope and start saying, "No, nah, he's okay, he's okay, he's okay," and waving everybody in. It's not even your party, you know. And then <laughs> just like, you know, and again, and then you go, "Right, where's my table?" And they go, "What did he say? Who's that guy?" You know, like, you know, it's like fantastic. So we just get away with murder, really. Okay. Uh, so not you, like Michael Alex, sorry. No, no, I know. In, yeah. a, in a statement, basically, because you're, yeah. you're a party guy. You've always been... Yeah, I mean, we used to love it. The reception we got in America was amazing. I mean, I mean, the most Americans at that time were getting um, a lot of the DJs and the club kids were getting just reading Mix Mag, so we were in there all the time. So we were like celebrities when we when we got there, you know, like in the early nineties, and we were like just set like kings. We picked up in limos, like zooming around, you know, VIP access everywhere we went. I mean, straight to the front of the queue, really looked after. I mean, it was, we couldn't have been better, you know, I, it was either time of my life. It was like, uh, which was different from when I was there with the, all the hip hop thing and the, the indie guy, the guys, because it was like, we were just like loading trucks and just like, still having a great time, don't get me wrong, you know, but, but you know, we really lived it up when we came over. We had so much money. We had more money than sense, they say. <laughs> You know, so we, big, you know, saying everybody because everybody was asking the same question those days. Yeah, it's floating around and champagne <laughs> floating around and a lot of good stuff. A lot oh, of man. feel good was floating around. Very yeah. nice. I remember that with him. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It was a lot of that. You know, and um, and the notes were like the thing was like your notes are all the same size. So we were just giving people eight like, hundred dollar <laughs> bills, is like thinking they were one dollar bills. You wait, know, wait, wait. Let me just reverse back a little bit. So from the time when you became, when you were roading, so you yeah. quit, school, you quit school, correct? Yeah. Okay. So you went with the class, you, you went around the world and did all that with them. When and how does back to basics begin? What's the premise? In other words, the blueprint to well, create I mean, this night. I mean, I was so lucky to be in America at the time when you know all these clubs were you were you were all playing house music when it was like you know it just first started you know marshall jefferson just was doing like uh you know move your body was it move your body or just made that move i can't remember and todd terry was he, he made them just made that move on black right on west um West End Records, and around that time, that's like so eighty six, eighty seven. Yeah. So, so I was right, right there at the right time. Forrest Gump, as they called himself, you know, like uh, just like waltzing into. Didn't even realize we were in the Paradise Garage at one point, and it was like, you know, it was just like, what, what's that all about? You know, it, it was on a. Can't remember what night it was. You know, we just went there, and I, and it was only later on that I saw it on a, on on a video, and I said, oh, I've been there, and then it was like. Paradise Garage. I didn't. We did. We used to go to Save the Robots as well down in uh, Alphabet City, um, which only sold one drink, if I remember, just that vodka. 
That's where I discovered Doc Martin there. And um, I wrote, um, I said to him, I said, what's your name? He said, Doc Martin, what's yours? And I said, Dave Beer. He said, I don't believe you. I said, I don't believe you either. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so, so I got an hundred dollar bill, which was my trademark at the time. And I wrote um, a marker pen and I wrote my number on it and gave him the hundred dollar bill. And he said, what is this? And I said, it's your deposit. And he said, for what? And I said, you're going to come to England to play at my club. And I said, if you, if you, you can either have the $100 bill or you can like call the number on there and you can, there's a few more where that came from. And, uh, and I think you're fantastic. And that's the way we, I went around, you know, like, like I got Frankie Knuckles to do this, the same way and um, Little Lou Vega, um, all those guys, you know, like, you know, they just thought I was some kind of, I mean, I don't know what they thought of me, they tell you. You know, like, but, but we got on so well. But the crazy just, English guy running around throwing money at everybody. We were like, yeah. what, who is this guy? Yeah, what, it was. Who it, is this guy? It, we, we, were having, we were having so much fun. But then when we brought everyone over to England, like, you know, because the, the guys over there, well, you weren't getting paid that much money, really. And then, But in England, you were superstars. That's you right. know, and I, so I remember David Morales going into a record store one day. We walked in and everybody's looking and he, all these records are there. He's going, oh, my God, they're my records. And we're going, yeah. You know, I mean, he's going, wow. Well, people know me. You know, I'm like, people know you, mate. You know what I mean? It was like unbelievable. You know, it's like, and it was such, it was such a lovely experience to, to, to be able to, to give them that, that opportunity over me. I mean, there was, some DJs, um, it got too much for them. They got too big for their boots, but some didn't. And some were just like the real deals that, you know, they knew. And they never forgot. And always like, have always been there for us. So, and so, but we forged some friendships that will be there for ever and ever and ever, you know. And God rest Frankie and, you know, and uh, and people like Scott Hardkiss, who's no longer here. And, and there's a lot of people gone now, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I mean, and Cindy Arto, because we were making records with a lot of the guys, like, you know, Don Trent, Eddie Flashing Folks, um, who else? Um, uh, Shay Damier. Um, we were putting all their Josh Wink. We were putting all their records out as well on Back to Basics. So, oh, like, yeah, um, we had a record label. That's right. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about this. So the, the club night becomes with Mix Mag a iconic night because yeah. every DJ was traveling into the UK wanted to play this club. I remember. I mean, for, for a little while in the Alcyon years, the first couple of years, it was almost like the Studio 54 of uh, England. It was like Bergheim. It was like the destination place, you know, so people were traveling all over the world to, to come to see us for like about two years. And it was just, uh, we were turning away thousands. It was just crazy. We just like, couldn't even believe the, the, the hype that went on. But, but it, you know, it was like, it, it was just absolute pandemonium. And, um, but yeah, great. The, the city didn't know what had happened. You know, it was like, we were like, they were just thinking, who are these guys? And what are they up to? They must be up to no good. But we were. <laughs> yeah. well, we, we were having fun, but, you know. So, like, but, you know, but these days it's different because then they realise that, the amount of economy and the ec the economics and the uh, and also you know the culturally what we brought to the city and bringing like people from all over the world you know some of the biggest artists in the world well, there. Let's let's do this for a second. Let me let me play let me play because I want to show this. Carl Cox, okay. Yep. Um, let's see if I can find it now. Sorry, everybody. We're trying to make this work. I got hit with a thousand. In the middle? I got hit. I got hit with that. Yeah, I got it. I just got to play it. Here we go. Pure madness. No compromise. Music lovers. Join Edge House music. Friendship. Love. In the dance floor, organized chaos, hot sweaty hot club, disorganized chaos. It's the life of soul, really. Uh, 
think I know it's coming here. Back to basics is obviously very old school, so it can mean to many people a number of things, but to me it means a bit of an institution, really. We moved up to Leeds knowing a lot about Back to Basics, but having seen it firsthand, I mean, it's, it's, it's more than just a night. Basics has, has really uh, kept its integrity of, of what it is as a company, um, of what it can create at the time for people and the music and the concepts and the style of, of what that's all about. Unite the people. I think every single DJ brings something to the table for Basics. For me, they're probably the best, the world, best residents in the world. You know, Ralph's just just an amazing, amazing DJ. Um, it's really flippant to say Back to Basics is a nightclub. I think it's been a lot more than that to a lot of people, people involved, people that come. There's a lot of very good DJs out there, but um, I think the best DJs often thrive in those kind of dark, underground warehouses, you know, with leaky roofs and um, dodgy toilets. <laughs> You don't want to become part of like cop and club, you know, brown nosing any of that cop companies. You <laughs> just stay in the underground, even though it gets bigger and bigger. It's the real deal. And there's not many things that left that are. Really, it's just because we say two to our original ethos of being two steps further than any other fucker. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's coming here shortly. <laughs> Fat Boy Slim was, was one of the first ones I came to. I'm going to let you talk a little bit about it while while it's in the background. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy, that was a crazy night. That was the last night at church in Cal. Bless him. Um, things were going, weren't going too good at the end with my partners. Um, there, uh, there was a bit of school duggery going on, should I say, that always happens in clubland. And uh, but Cal got wind of it and he rang me up and said, Dave, is this right? And I said, Yeah. He said, Why didn't you say anything? I said, Well, you know, I'm a proud man. He said, Mate, you've done me enough favors. He said, What about if I come to England early and come and play for you? And I said, Well, I can't afford that, Cal. Now, you know, he said, He said, No, I don't want any money. And he, he just came and played and saved the day, really. And I'll forever and ever and ever be grateful to that, you know. But a beautiful thing, you know, like when you do good things and sometimes you wonder, you know, what's going on in the world and you're out where everyone falls on bad times, but it's just like really cool when, when the cavalry come in to save you, you know, like that. When Because uh, there's a lot of people out there, you know, especially in clubland that want to have you over, you know. And uh, and that's what was going down, but my friends got wind of it and uh, saved the day. So, so what exactly? Like, when we when you said save the day, what exactly happened with that gig? What was? Well, the- yeah, I mean, basically, I turned the club round. I uh, started a new business with um, it there, but then found out it went two million pounds up in equity when I turned the place around. And I was not, wasn't taking any money from the club, thinking it was we had the company, it was all dividends. And then uh, we found out on the grapevine that it was up for sale. And, uh, yeah, without me knowing. So, um, yeah, so it was a... I won't go into too much detail, but, you know, that's what was going down. So, um, but, you know... I was just thought, I'm, I'm too long in the tooth for this. You know, I can't believe this is actually happening to me at my age. You know, it's like, it was like, you know, it was just crazy because we were opening a music academy for the kids, the council were involved. I mean, it was amazing uh, prospect, but, you know, I mean, but even so, sell it, yeah, for two, to make two million profit, but at least cut your partners in, you know. But, um, but luckily, um, you know, in the last thing, a few people stepped in and uh, and and they heard on the grapevine. But I I didn't say. I just said kept my mouth shut. I didn't want to say anything because I was kind of on paper. But it was such a big success. It was one of the top clubs in the country. And uh, but you know, behind the scenes, there was a lot of skullduggery going on. And it's like, but you know, you live to you will live to fight another day or dance another day. And, um, you know, life goes on, yeah. So how do you recover from something like this? 
What's the recovery? Because everything's in place. The machine's running. What do you do? I mean, you just, you just you just push yourself down and you wait for the bell and you come back out the corner again, put your gum shield back in and come back out, you know. I mean, it's like I've done it so many times now, you know, like sometimes it's been me who's just said, right, I'm leaving, and walked away after petty arguments, impulsive behaviour, you know, like at the end of the night, you know, where's my money? You know what I mean? Like, well, if you don't give me it, I'm leaving. No, you won't leave. Right, see about that and left and uh, we've opened like so many clubs around the city but it's kept things alive you know like everybody that goes too corporate i believe that this blueprint of all these big warehouse parties now they're just there's no soul in them you know and it's like it's just kind of ruining the scene to an extent that you know it's just like a big cattle market ten thousand people into an old hangar and they're just like charging stupid money you know it's like and like and a lot of them go by the wayside as you know a lot of these super clubs are not there anymore where he's like back to basics oh, is just celebrated 30 years you know we, let's talk about who's left you had cream around you yeah ministry of sound yeah. around yeah. you Gay Crash, yeah. Gay Crash, yeah. All, all of them, Fantasia. I mean, I mean, just so many. The list goes on and on and on, you know. Um, uh, you know, there's so many. Like, but you know, the thing is, we never. We were super. We didn't want to be a super club. I didn't want to uh, sell baseball caps and t-shirts you couldn't get into my club like that you know so why would we sell them you know it was like so we never went down to merchandise we did a, we only did a limited mix albums we did a couple one with Derek Carter which broke him in England um, Weber, Andrew Weberall and Ralph and then I waited another 10 years and then Tanaglia did the 10th anniversary one which it made, meant, made sense because half of his name he's got 10 in his name so so right Okay, so he, he did that, and then and people used to say, like, come on, we're, we're offering me stupid money, stupid sponsorship money and stupid record deals, but we'd just be saying, no, we're not interested. Because um, we had a car accident, uh, me and my partner, on the way to a gig in Scotland, and uh, Ali died, sadly, and so did Ralph's um, girlfriend. Um, I was a passenger in the seat in the, in the car as well. Um, it wasn't a drunken or... Um, and he, it was no, no fault of any alleys, but there was bad weather going on the way up and we crashed. So we just never wanted to change the ethos of the club. It was in, it was like, we were never going to take any, it was not, it wasn't a brand. It was like, it was our baby, you know? So like where everyone else saw their clubs as brands and, you know, marketable and, and saleable, you know, I've never, it's never been for sale. You know, people, we, I've turned down some stupid things, really, when I think about it. Sure. But, you know, some things are, money's, money's one thing, you know, like, but integrity and like, being the real deal is, is, means much more, you know. And I think people resonate with that. And that's the thing. You kept it, you kept it going regardless of everyone trying to take you down. And that's the horrible thing about Clubland. The different, <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody. When you're at that moment that you're, you're not trying to be at the top. You're just doing what you normally do. Yeah, yeah, I know. On a proper do, right? Just do it right. And then all of a sudden, now you're the target that everybody wants to come after to destroy. Think about yeah. that. So uh, it's always been. Uh, well, I'm oh, sorry. Like you know, like like uh, you know, uh, I mean. The American, in America, it's a lot more, you guys, you know, like, uh, if you see somebody in a nice car, you'll go, yeah, way to go, guy, you know, like, nice car. But in England, they'll, you build you up and they go, wanker, you know what I mean? And just like, you get say it's such a crazy kind of mentality. People build you up and they want to knock you back down. Or, and there's a lot of, je oh, a lot of jealousy. Mm, sorry about this. There's a lot of jealousy and... Uh, and it's like, but you know, I I didn't care. I just kind of plod on, and and I the, the thing for me is like, um, you know, I, I like to think that I can go. When I go to bed on the night, I put my head on my pillow. I can go to sleep, you know, because I know there's nobody out there that's saying a bad word, you know, because I've never given anybody any reason, you know. So and never retaliate. Just just get on with it and just do the do. And we like to party. It's like you know, it's what we do, you know. And I think we do it. Well, please search for part two 
of this podcast on the platform you're watching or listening to. And please do not forget to follow us.